Hey, Lynn, how's it going? Hey. Hope you don't mind uh, doubling up on the content like this. But, uh, the weekly or monthly meeting came up and uh, yeah, seemed like a natural thing to talk about. Hey there. Howdy. Hi, Lynn, that's an amazing set of books you have behind you. <laughs> All math and physics or what? No, nah, that's a virtual background. Oh, it oh. is? Oh, okay. It fooled me. It works. Yeah, it, it works. I also have this room full of books. <laughs> that looks great. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying wow. to figure out what country this came from, and I, I can, <laughs> I, I can't read any of the titles. But you know, guessing from the looks of the spines, I see some things that look like oh, Loeb classics up in the uh, top left. And which? How'd you left. get those? What'd you search for? Book? Yeah, yeah, I did uh, book. Uh, Library backgrounds, book backgrounds. Oh. Well, it beats the Golden Gate Bridge, so. Yeah. And of course, uh, I also have this. I'm not sure where I'll need this background. Yeah, for <laughs> or this background. Oh. That's... I like this one the best. There's that Book of the Month Club history series uh, that's right to the right of my head. I oh, can't I remember who wrote it. But anyway, from out here, it looks genuine. Otherwise, I wouldn't have asked. It looks real, unlike most backgrounds. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> look too different from my old apartment in Austin which I miss, but uh, I don't miss the heat in Austin or the allergies. Oh, where are you now? San Francisco. Oh, okay. So all the books are in storage. This is my library now. <laughs> it's neat. Is that a VHS tape? I couldn't see what you held up. Um, yeah, no, it was a phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I've put all my books onto a VHS tape. Uh, right. <laughs> this is sort of black and shiny. Yeah, didn't yeah. see it. Very low res. <laughs> and that's why I'm here. I'm hoping I can figure out how to catalog it all with uh, category theory. The irony is tape is still the winner along certain uh, performance metrics, right? Like, is it when it comes to cold storage, like dollar per gigabyte you can store, like tape's the way to go. Wowee. 
<laughs> IBM will sell one to you. You know, you can hook it up to your mainframe. Yeah. No doubt it'll run on an AS400 then. All right. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. We got about 14 people so far, but as usual, we like to wait a few minutes just for everyone to get Zoom up and running and so on. So I have a question for everyone while, uh, if, Ryan, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, how much math has everyone had? Uh, has everyone had uh, class and group theory, ring theory, uh, discrete mathematics, graph theory? That's interesting. Public theory. <laughs> I, I had some introduction to, to ring theory and you know how to prove that, a, uh, that Cauchy sequences are a ring. Uh, but you know, and I would then I ran into a whole bunch of mathematicians who knew all about group theory, and they were disappointed. They, they thought that group theory was more important. So I I didn't really advance beyond that too much. But I did a lot of logic. Uh, my logic professor is still teaching, uh, and uh, he teaches deontics, which is about uh, uh, how you deal with things that you have to do or or must do or shouldn't do or things like that and how do you build logic around that um if it isn't too far in the back what text did you use for your logic class oh let's see boy that was a long time ago <laughs> yeah. i'm not sure it was uh, i actually took like a we had an intermediate logic and then advanced logic and uh uh, it was it was pretty you know it, it wasn't like all this ornate stuff that that we've had later uh, but I really it was just really uh, useful for learning programming I looked at Prolog for a long time and and uh, uh, Robin Milner's stuff that was kind of interesting. <laughs> what? Somebody really didn't like Robin Milner's stuff. I guess. <laughs> Carl Hewitt, how about that? <laughs> well, yeah, there, that's where the, well, yeah, we don't have to repeat the late controversy on Wikipedia around him. But, uh, oh, okay. So I don't there have- There is one, yeah. I can leave it at that. <laughs> um, I don't have any math beyond um, high school. So I may be at a disadvantage here. Oh, well, we admire your you know, willingness to, to come anyway. It's commendable. Uh, well, I, I have been studying category theory just in order to figure out, um, you know, it, how I can use it for programming, but, but uh, I still feel like a beginner. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, anyone else we have a, before we get started, want to introduce themselves? This is Nathan. I, I'm, uh, I'm in my 70s. I retired. I've had a lifelong fascination with math and physics. So a couple of years ago, I went into deep study. So I'm self-studying. And, you know, in the Bay Area, there's all these great universities. You can just walk in and audit a class mm -hmm. uh, online, too, before, you know, before COVID. So I'm self-taught. I'm probably at the level now of maybe a sophomore undergraduate uh, oh. you know, in, in math and physics, maybe a junior. Good to see even more self-study going on. Or, uh self-study combined with auditing, I guess, whatever you call that. Cool. Other other folks want to introduce themselves? Yeah, so hi. I'm Vlad, and I do teach logic at San Clara University, and I'm a like, category philosopher, and I have a book, like Crash Course of Math for Programmers. So that's it. Cool. Welcome. Yeah. Anyone else? We're still seeing a few people trickle in. So now's a good time to say hi. Josh is here. Um, I am here, just listening in. So yeah, I'm Josh. I work at Uber. And I've worked with uh, Ryan on category theory and um, uh, data model we'll uh, talk about called algebraic property graphs. Um, so that's a, a data model that we use at Uber for um, 
uh, basically integrating all of our data across the different languages and frameworks we use, um, you know, protobuf, thrift, avro, uh, relational schemas, uh, and so on. Um, so category theory has been useful for tying all those different uh, data models together based on the commonalities between the data models. Thanks, Josh. Uh, yeah, for those who don't know the genesis of this particular talk, uh, it started um, to go on Lynn's show about graphs. Josh interviewed me on these particular slides. Uh, it was early in the morning though, so people at, at this meetup didn't really have a chance to see them apart from watching them directly on the graph show. So uh, yeah, this is an encore um, for this particular group if there are more questions or you know, we can dive deeper in the material, that kind of stuff. And I think with that, we should probably get started. So, oh, and we're getting even more people, up to 18. Okay, I did uh, group mute. Uh, and so I think, yeah, if people have questions, you can unmute and then speak up. I'll try to watch the chat window, but it can be uh, hard to watch the chat and do the, the talking at the same time. So I might uh, might forget from time to time speaking up is the best way to go. But um, anyway, yeah, the, uh, the background here has been uh, mentioned before. This is a talk about how graph theory and category theory relate. Uh, it's a encore presentation. These slides were uh, made for Lynn's graph show, which you can go find on YouTube and there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, but uh, for this talk, yeah, hopefully people can uh, interrupt and, and ask questions as we go. So um, these slides should seem very similar to the introductory slides that are on categoricaldata.net because it's, you know, th this is all within the, I within categorical databases, right? So um, the, the broad strokes haven't changed, but the focus of these are going to be different. It's going to be about graphs and about RDF. Um, about the stuff going on at Uber and so forth. But um, anyway, just to recap, the, the basic idea here is that uh, category theory, it's a branch of math, it migrates theorems from one part of math to another. And so to the extent that we think of knowledge as being theorems, uh, which is kind of a premise of you know, knowledge representation and all that, uh, that means that category theory can also be used to migrate uh, knowledge from one schema, database schema to another, or uh, change the schema that an ontology is on or, or do the, the analogs of all of that, uh, but within data. So um, anyway, here at Connexus, we're um, commercializing an open source software system called CQL that hosts a lot of these uh, academic um, experiments such as described here. Um, and anyway, right, as I said before, the point of these slides as opposed to others that people may have seen that look similar is that uh, we're going to focus today on the idea that categories are graphs with extra structure and then try to get at the connections uh, between the two, and in particular, this algebraic connection. So um, anyway, with that, uh, let me pause quickly. Are there any questions before we get started? Cool. Okay. So the goal of this talk is not really to get into category theory specifics. I'm told by Lynn that as soon as the math slides come out, people who are watching the graph show, uh, the audience fell off of a cliff. However, seeing as now this is a uh, category theory meetup, hopefully people here will actually uh, appreciate or at least stand a quick review of what category theory is. Um, and so there's going to be a, a few different concepts in this talk to relate to each other. There's the notion of a category, which is like a graph with extra structure. There's um, a notion of a presentation of a category. And then there's a notion of a graph. We're going to see RDF. So there's going to be a lot of different algebraic structures running around. Uh, but this, is, this one is called category. And uh, it's defined as follows. So um, we have a collection. Uh, elements of which we call objects. So we'll write these as A, B, and C, you know, whatever we have, we can have zero, finitely many, uh, infinitely many, and then uh, morphisms as well. So we'll write these F and G and H, and there too, we can have zero, one, two, infinitely many, you know, uncountably infinitely many, what have you. Um, okay, so you might think of those um, is nodes and edges. We call them objects and arrows. Uh, the point more is that um, there's going to be additional stuff that comes along with those in order to have a category. So uh, one of the things that we have to have is a function called source. 
um, that takes each morphism to an arrow. So we say that each arrow has a source uh, and it's always exactly one of the objects. Similarly, we have a function called the target. It takes each morphism to an object. And so um, each arrow has exactly one source, exactly one target. We write that like this, F goes from S to T, uh, like node, arrow, node. So, you know, the, the notation's meant to be suggestive, you know, category theory picks objects and arrows is the name here, but, you know, so far this really just looks like a node and an edge uh, and another node. Uh, where things start to get different from just having a graph is that we have to be able to compose these edges. And so, um, there's an additional bit of not bit amount of additional function here, the composition function uh, that takes two morphisms that have matching uh, targets and sources. So we have F going from A to B and G going from B to C. You know, B is in common; they have they have to match like that. But then when they do, uh, we can compose them, and so we have to give as part of the category this operation, the little circle here, uh, that takes G and F and then gives um, an arrow from A to C. And so that looks like this. So this is basically saying that we have a, a partial operation, this little circle. It's defined exactly when uh, the tips and the tails here match. Um, and what it gives you is this uh, arrow here. And we require that this composition operation be associative so that if you have, uh, you, you perform the operation twice, it doesn't matter uh, which way you, you do the, the grouping of them. You can start with F and then do G uh, and then do H or start with F and then apply that to uh, G and H afterwards. So uh, associative. And then finally, there is uh, an identity arrow. So this also has to come with the category for each object A, you have to give me, I guess us, um, a particular arrow from A to A and it has to be the unit of that uh, composition function. So composing with the identities is the same as doing nothing is the point there. Anyway, that is the definition of a category or rather one definition of a category. Uh, there are others. This one was chosen because it looks like having a graph plus this extra composition thing and these identities. And, uh, but there's, there's definitely other ways um, to state it. Um, I'll pause for questions in just a second, but let me also briefly say what a functor is. So in math, you know, we usually don't just say, here's a thing. We always say, here's a thing, and here's, the, here's what maps from the, between these things are, right? So if you have a group, then to study groups, you need to define a morphism of groups. If you have a ring, then to really understand rings, you need to understand the functions that preserve ring structure. So uh, a a morphism of categories, a homomorphism of categories, if you will, a map between categories is called a functor. It's called F, and it's designed to preserve the structure of the category. And so what's the structure? Well, the relevant structure here is the composition relation and the identities. And so what the functor does is it takes each object in your source category and gives you an object in your target category. And then it takes each arrow in your source category and gives you an arrow in your target category, but it has to do that in a way that preserves these identities and composition. And so in particular, it has to be the case that if you have a composition of two things in C, that when you apply the functor, you get out the composition in D of the, the images of the two things. So um, anyway, we won't see functors as much as categories, but they both notions are required for completeness. And that's sort of the review of Category Theory 101. So pause there, any questions? Yes. Um, sure. So before Category Theory came out, I guess in the 40s and 50s, um, we had abstract algebra. So this is in a sense, maybe naively put, an abstraction of abstract algebra, right? Very much so. These axioms are an abstraction of uh, sets and functions. So okay. uh, uh, yeah. Which we is, might have even called it like, uh, yeah, there's a deep connection between category theory and algebra. And uh, it's more that we want to combine the results from both is like claim that category theory, it, like, like category theory is algebra, I guess you could say in the same sense, group theory uh, is algebra. Well, yeah, but, I would object to the idea that category theory is based on sets. So models in sets, uh, they use sets, but the theory itself, 
is not related to sets. Okay, but wait, that wasn't, I didn't finish my, we didn't get to my question. Yeah. Which, so, okay, it's an abstraction of algebra. And algebra itself is an abstraction of, of various other, uh, you know, lower entities, uh, objects, and so on. How do we know that this is the, we don't know the category is the end, right? I mean, it's 1945, there were no categories. Now we are seven years later, we have categories. Is oh, there sure. Some no, I mean, categories are just. That says that this is, this is it? No, you're not going any further? Is it possible that in 10, 15 years, somebody might come up with something even more? Oh, of uh, course. I mean, a, a category is just a particular class of algebraic structure, right? Okay. It, so it's like anytime you think group theory, just also, or category theory, just also think group theory. And if like a statement's not sort of true about one, it won't be sort of true about the other that, yes, there's all kinds of algebraic gizmos out there that are not categories. There's even things called N categories. So the category theory itself uh, story goes goes more and more complex. So yeah, the okay. category theory is not the end all of mathematics, far from it. Okay, so it doesn't have supremacy in that sense, right? There's more. Definitely not. Okay. Uh, I, I will say this though, that as meta mathematics, it does seem to have a unique position in the sense that in practice, we find a lot of things tend to be categories and that the abstraction somehow feels right when we're de dealing with like computational systems. Like right. I take that as evidence or, or I, I, that feels natural to me given that I see in these axioms, the like intended model being sets and functions. I mean, it, uh, I think it was Vlad, right? Is right that that was, there's more to it than that. But um, anyway, I, yeah, it's, I guess we're getting the philosophy, but. Uh, <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, other questions? Uh, Cool. Okay. So yeah, being all practical minded engineers here, our goal isn't so much to uh, do philosophy on these abstract widgets, but like put them to work, uh, you know, affecting change in reality. So uh, the idea here is that we're going to use categories as models of database schemas. Um, and so the, the word model, um, it's a bit of a, it's overused. So it's going to come up in a variety of contexts in this talk. Um, the point is more though that I'm gonna use these brackets, what are called church brackets, uh, to indicate uh, going from a schema, which is like something we have on a computer and it's a finite object. It's gonna be a, something we call a presentation of a category. And then the actual category that we have that could have like infinitely many objects and infinitely many arrows in it. And that's gonna be the little brackets around S. So. Um, Basic, the basic idea is that we're going to define a schema S to be a directed multigraph. So that's so, you know, we didn't go over directed multigraphs, but hopefully that's we can, and that's obvious to the people here. And then we're going to add an additional bit of structure, uh, a set of paths through the graph. Um, we're going to call those equivalent paths. Anyway, from that graph and these set of paths, we can build a category in the sense of this slide called brackets F. And we're gonna do that as follows and then I'll, I'll show an example. So uh, the basic idea here is that we said a schema S is a directed multigraph and multigraphs have nodes and edges. And so the objects of our category bracket S are gonna be the nodes of S. And then the arrows in our category are not gonna be the edges in the schema. They're not gonna be the edges in the graph they're gonna be the paths through that graph. So it's like think path algebra rather than edge algebra. And then these uh, paths called equivalent through the graph, we're gonna like in our model, uh, treat them that way. So let's see a picture because that's um, a lot to take in, but I always like to start with the definitions and then go to examples rather than vice versa. So here at the top is an example schema we said it was a directed multigraph. So here we've also given the, uh, the nodes and edges uh, labels so that they're easier to, to talk about. So here at the top is the directed graph. Here uh, at the bottom are two paths marked equivalent. So one path is the path that goes, uh, that takes the self loop around manager and then works into department. So, so incidentally, these are uh, employees and departments, uh, the edges, our employees have managers and employees works in departments, departments have secretaries, uh, so on and so forth. Here is the other 
path equation that says uh, if you go from department to employee and then go from employee to department, uh, you end up where you started. That's like saying every department secretary works in the same department that they're the secretary of. So um, I better pause here for questions, but at least uh, hopefully it's clear up at the top, we have a directed multigraph and then a set of paths. In this case, there's two of them uh, marked equivalent. And then this is what we're calling a database schema. And then its meaning, its mathematical denotation is that of a category in the sense of this, of the slide above, where the arrows are the nodes in this graph, and then the arrows are the paths through it, but where we equate paths that under these equations here. So it's like equivalence classes of paths. So you might have one equivalence path that's uh, this thing here and this thing here, and then a whole bunch of others. So anyway, uh, I'll be better pause there. Um, does everyone recognize um, schemas, uh, a schema up there at the top? Uh, what I have an issue with is, is the equivalence. On, on the left-hand side, you have employer goes to department equals employer gets goes to work. So is that what you mean by an equivalence? The left and the right of those are different ways to start from the one place and end up at the end place? Uh, correct. And this one should have a little dot in the middle. But uh, yep, you uh, a path equivalence is you pick a start, you pick a stop, and then you find and you, you give two paths from the start to the stop. That's correct. Okay. So they're equations basically formed out of, uh, you know, treating these like function symbols and, and sorts, if that makes term, that terminology is helpful. You can algorithmically, given a, a, a schema like that, you can algorithmically figure out the equivalences, right? If you The equivalences have to be given, right? So this yeah. top thing is just a graph. And then there's going to be, you know, an infinite number of things you could choose as your path equivalences. Each choice of path equivalences is a different schema, right? These are like data integrity constraints. In this particular schema, it's the case that every manager works in the same department that they manage. But that may not be true in somebody else's schema. And so they would not have this uh, in their schema. So yeah, the, the equations are part of what comes with the schema. They're not something that can be deduced from the graph. Other questions? Uh, I have a question. So we don't represent the identity map between each node? Uh, it's implicit that we're going to be creating a category from this. That category needs an identity map, but this is just a directed graph. And so um, in the category that this denotes, the identities are the zero length paths, right? There's always a zero length path from department to department. It's empty. That plays the role of the identity path. Ditto for employees and, and strings and everything else. I see. see that right with department secretary works being the empty path. Oh yeah, right. There's a there's an example of a identity path right there. Cool. Other questions? Okay. So, uh, right. The upshot of all this is that uh, you know we have this schema, which is to say a presentation of a category. It denotes a category, and uh, what is data on this schema? Well, uh, denotationally, like at the level of math, what the data is, what a database is, is a functor from the category this denotes to a category that we call a category of sets. And there, um, its objects are all sets and its arrows are all functions. So what that means is to give a database on this schema, we have to give for each node uh, a set, so in this case, the set uh, for employees is uh, 101, 102, 103. For departments, we need a set. In this case, it's Q10 and X02. Strings, we need a set. In this case, it's going to be an infinite set. I started listing some strings we're interested in, like Al and Bob up at the front. Uh, but it's uh, really all of them. Um, and then for each edge, we need to give a function you know, going from the source to the target. And then from that, we can create the actual set valued functor by kind of, you know, it's easy to see once you have this, how to like follow paths through it. So anyway, uh, what's an example? So the manager of employee 101 is employee 103. Similarly, 102's manager is themselves, I guess. And so when 103's manager is also themselves. So this is a very, this is an organization with two CEOs and only one employee. Um, 
you know, and you have cyclic relationships like that, you're gonna you know, end up with the cycles at some point to have finite data. Uh, uh, what are some other examples? So works in, so employee 101, who is Al Aiken, uh, works in department Q10, which is the CS department. So anyway, this is, this is the algebra part, right? That up here is a signature, uh, for those familiar with that terminology. This is a theory, right, a set of equations. And then this is actually a model, right? Like one set for each sort, these are called in algebra, the, the nodes are called sorts, and then one function uh, for each uh, function symbol in this case. And so, yeah, that's why we tend to call the work algebraic databases, at least when we publish on it, because it's really what's going on is that you have an algebra down here and we're gonna be manipulating it. Um, it's the category that's the schema. So tabular data, uh, graph-based schema, although as we'll see in just a bit, you can also represent this in a graph form. So let me pause there. Any questions about uh, the data? So is data itself the functor between the sets and functions and the schema? Correct. These tables are a functor from this category up at the top into the category of sets. So a database is a set valued functor. And that can take a little getting used to if you're not used to thinking of databases as functions, but that's really what it is. It's a function. It takes employee to this set, it takes department to this set. Yeah, that's correct, set valued functors. Other questions? All right, so getting back to graphs. As I mentioned, it's really our database schemas that are graphs, or rather graphs plus what we call path equations and that it's our data that's tabular. However, you know, when you have tabular data and a schema, you also have graph data. And so this construction here, um, it's kind of obvious. It was first worked out like in category theory by a mathematician named Grothendieck in like the 60s, but it's a, a way to convert tabular data into a multi-graph or a directed multi-graph representation and vice versa given another graph that serves as the schema. So uh, what does this look like? Well, you know, each entity gets a node or is a node up here. So 101, 102, 103. And then you just add an edge for each, each time you have a, a fact, right? So the secretary of Q10 equals 101 is what this means. And uh, if I were not quite so lazy, I would have indicated in this graph up at the top, the commuting triangle or the commuting squares, if any, saying uh, which paths through these graphs are actually uh, the same. Or maybe there aren't any actually, I'm, I'm not sure. So, uh, but anyway, that's the, uh, the basic idea is that, you know, by using categorical foundations, uh, you get a bunch of nice things. One of the nice things is that, oh, we can take our data and turn it into a graph and, and vice versa once we know the schema and that's what this looks like. So pause here. Any questions on what, uh, what data looks like as graphs? Uh, don't we effectively have every path equivalence in this? You know, if we have Q10 secretary to 101 to manager goes to 103, works goes back to Q10, isn't that effectively the same as Q10 secretary goes to 101, works goes back to Q10? It could be, it would not surprise me at all if this graph were somehow maximal or minimal with respect to the path equations. I'm sure we could look that up or, or ask the CQL tool. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, is there anything else we can say about that? So, yeah, we can talk about it later. Is the, the general like, uh, other people have questions on uh, what they're seeing here. Okay, cool. So uh, why else might we like categorical databases besides the fact that you can turn them into graphs? Uh, lots of other stuff. So they admit a very nice syntax that looks like SQL that 
happens to have the same semantics when you work out the details. So uh, something like this in an ER diagram, your SQL to uh, find the name of any manager's department would require a three-way join or at least be written that way. Uh, in this formalism, it's not even a three-way join. You're just sort of following these paths of foreign keys. So, uh, you know, semantics aside about whether you can, you know, rewrite joins as foreign key dereferences, uh, we would claim that this notation is just like better, that working in more, a more functional form uh, gives you advantages as, of a formalism that uh, SQL does not have. So anyway, there's a nice select from where story um, in this, this uh, data model that's quite intuitive. Uh, let me pause here. Um, any questions? Like we didn't really define all this formally, but hopefully the intuition is coming across. Is a dummy variable? Uh, the E here? Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it is true that in this case, uh, we didn't need to write it, whereas in the right, we did E1 and E2 to disambiguate. So this was a little verbose. Um, yeah, I guess you could call that a dummy variable. Oh, yeah, I guess here too, we did department as D, even though there's just one. Um, Incidentally, having this syntax like this gives us a compilation pathway, right? Because we can take something that looks like this, uh, turn it into SQL, and then to the extent anyone has an SQL-like interface to any data store, uh, we can you know, execute our, our queries uh, directly that way. So, uh, and this equivalence works both ways. Oh, and speak of the devil, what does it look like when you, uh, when you actually run these things? So. Uh, we're going to change the example a little. So now we're no longer doing uh, employees and departments because we need to have two schemas related to each other to move data. And you know, up here, this is, you know, I really like this thing, but it's it's kind of big to show the effect of a query on. So uh, we're going to switch to two different schemas to illustrate uh, query evaluation. And what's cool in category theory, uh, it's dual co-evaluation. So. Um, anyway, suppose we have two schemas uh, that look as follows. Each one is in a box. So uh, our source schema for this query is actually written on the right. That's kind of an artifact of where these uh, slides came from. So there's one table called n, uh, name, salary, and age are attributes off of it. They're integer and string valued. We've got, um, we're going to land on a, a, we're going to do a join decomposition. So we're going to land onto a schema with two tables and a foreign key between them. Uh, same attributes. So literally a join decomposition. Uh, what you do in CQL is you uh, write a collection of these little select from where's that moves data from right to left. So it'll actually take your table and break it apart. Uh, what's cool though, and is unique to category theory is that, you know, because of the way we defined queries, and I didn't really say what these things were, but it turns out that they are uh, this thing called a profunctor. So think functor, but you know, a little bit different. Um, when you do this, you find that every query you can write down, you can always uh, round trip it. So not invert it, although in this case, it actually does an inversion. But um, anyway, you get for every query you write down in, in category theory, you get two ways to run it forward and backward. The forward way does exactly what you would expect. And then the backward way, it doesn't quite undo things, but it uh, sends you back to where you came from in such a way that you can round trip. So what does that look like? Well, if you start with, um, right, and so here we started on the right and we did a join decomposition and we go back here to just demonstrate what's going on. We actually start, we're gonna start on the left and move to the right. Um, so you can take these two things, you can co-evaluate them along the query that we just did. That's gonna union them together to live over here. Uh, and then we can evaluate them, that is pull them back apart as I was showing up here. And then what category theory gives you is a unique way to round trip your data, take where you started from and assign it to where you ended up, right? There's a unique assignment, a unique embedding of this data uh, into this. So um, 
that's a, a bit of a hand wavy explanation. There's actually two ways to round trip, right? You can go from right to left and then back right, and you can go left to right and then back left. Uh, and I only showed one of them down here, but um, hopefully the idea is clear. Like one of the advantages of this formalism is uh, one query, two ways to run it, and they're related in a nice way. Uh, pause there, uh, questions on this more hand wavy segment? Okay, this is really meeting, reading more like, a, a, you know, come study category theory. Here's a teaser for all the cool stuff it'll do. Um, on those lines, I'll finish up the, uh, the cheerleading and then move on to some of the stuff about algebraic property graphs, which is uh, maybe a little more useful. So anyway, um, other interesting things that category theory gives you in this formalism. So, uh, you know, we were saying that schemas are directed labeled multigraphs and path equations. Uh, what the mathematics tells you is that you get other constructions. So we, we showed queries before. Um, there's a way you can do um, integration of schemas and data. It's something called a, a push out or a co-limit uh, or a quotient. You can start with two schemas. So here we have source one, source two. They're about observations and people. So this is like a health record context, uh, but they're different schemas, right? So this source one has methods uh, this source two doesn't, this source two has genders and the other one doesn't. And so you can formalize the overlap is yet a third schema and two mappings. So uh, functors, if you will, right? Ob object observation goes to observation. Uh, arrow G goes to this path G1 followed by G2. So that's where the color is coming into play. So anyway, you can uh, basically calculate how to integrate schemas using this mathematics, right? given source one, source two, and then the way in which they relate, math says there's exactly one uh, schema up to isomorphism that you can have that is their integration. Uh, dually, it, category theory gives you a, a very nice semantics for data. So this is just data on uh, what we had above, right? Here's our observations. Uh, observations. Peter has blood pressure. Uh, Paul has heart rates. Peter has weight. Um, this other corpus, we have Pete and Jane. So there's no Peter over here, just Pete, still blood pressure and weight, no genders. Um, anyway, what the math tells you is given overlap. So, you know, given Pete and Peter are related by, for example, just the fact that their uh, strings are the same, like given this, right? Someone, you know, we can't, it, it, you know, whether Pete and Peter are the same dude kind of depends on your semantics, what you want. Anyway, given that you get this unique way to integrate your data, right? It has exactly one missing gender, not zero, not two, right? Pete and Peter appear once, uh, right? This is this thing here that's the integrated results is unique uh, up to isomorphism. So anyway, that's, that's why we like the calculus. Um, I'll pause there and then switch to more uh, algebraic property graph stuff. Um, any questions? Are folks still finding this interesting? I'd hate to be lecturing on something no one wants to hear about. Can anyone still hear me at all? Yeah, I can still hear you. <laughs> nice. We're here. Yep. Sure, we do. Okay. All right. So yeah, we can uh, we can move on then. So. What you just saw was essentially a condensed version of the introductory academic talk that we give you know, all the time. This is a category. Um, this is how schemas are categories. When you define it that way, this is what data is. Here's how it looks like graphs, how you query it, how you integrate it. Uh, but what I'd like to talk about now is an application of all this. And in particular, this is how uh, I met Josh, which is that, you know, the the categorical constructions described above can also be, be brought to bear on, uh, you know, not just categories, but also other algebraic structures such as property graphs. So, um, right, this is where we're getting into the, the interplay between algebra and category theory. Um, anyway, over at Uber, and Josh, please, you know, stop me if uh, I say something wrong or you want to add uh, more flavor. Um, they have what we would call an ontology of a virtual knowledge graph that 
they put together. So the virtual knowledge graph you could think of as being all the data sources that are available. And the ontology says that what's in common among those all sources are a classification of four different types of things. So everything is either an element or a value or a label or a type uh, in Uber's data model. And so this forms a database schema as described up here. So we have elements, values, labels, and types. These are our nodes, just like before we had persons and employees and, and such. Uh, over at Uber, they're interested in elements, labels, values, and types. And then the functions between them, the foreign keys, if you will, are uh, quite natural. So every element uh, has a label, every label has a type. So th these are all functions, right? So every element has exactly one label, every label has exactly one type, every element has exactly one value, every, one, every value has exactly one type, such that the only path through this graph, the only non-trivial one, is the same. So if you start at an element, you find the label for it, and you look up the type, that's the same as the type of the value associated to it. So um, basically this, this should remind people of like, we're building a little uh, like type system or we're building a little um, like uh, meta model for what graphs are. Um, here's an example where we have, uh, what are the elements? Well, there's five of them. They're labeled as trips and users. So here's the label, we have user and trip. The, the, what we call the, <laughs> this is an unfortunate collision of terminology. The, the sigma here, what, what at Uber they would call the schema for the label of users is just a, a string for users. Whereas for trip, it's a pair of users. So what, what this is saying is that every user should be associated with a string and every trip should be associated with two users, I guess the driver and the passenger, although that's not really sure. Similarly, we have types available. So string is a type, user times user is a type, uh, you know, morally, like before with strings, we had infinitely many of those. Here we too have infinitely many, right? There's string, int, you know, string times int, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. So let's see. Oh, we have some, uh, some questions in the chat. So commutative diagram is essentially a guarantee that all data is valid with respect to its schema, regardless of the operations that we perform on it. Um, yeah, that's uh, well stated. What you would see in this diagram is the fact that uh, take this trip, it has a value that's a pair, and then this pair is type is user times user, right? And that's the same as if we start uh, here, we find the trip go over here to the label and then see that it's, it's user times user. So, um, you know, Josh put it more eloquently, but that's, I guess you'd call the defining equation of Uber's meta model uh, right there. So it's cool to see the commutative uh, square appear like so directly, but anyway, I'll, I'll pause here and let people stare at the screen at a while. Um, you know, don't read too much into the, the Greek letters here. They kind of help with making short theorem statements, but you know, really this is, you know, they're unique in between, you know, there's, there's only one function from element to label. So they're, you know, what to call them is, you know, kind of, kind of irrelevant. Um, anyway, any, any other questions? Can there be multiple elements pointing to the same label? Yes. Uh, in fact, here's, here's two elements that both point at trip. Oh, uh, I three elements that both point at user. Uh, ditto, you could have multiple labels that have the same, uh, what we would call schema. Again, unfortunate choice of word, but I, yeah, there's nothing, you know, you, you might have like a, you know, in addition to user having string, you might have like, I don't know, payer being a string or, right. So there, there'll definitely be multiple labels that uh, uh, have the same type associated to them in practice, for sure. Uh, good question. Any others? Okay, so the question I have is like, where did this times come from and string and all of this that uh, this schema does not fully characterize what's going on with Uber's meta model because, you know, this is just saying you have four sets and four functions that have to commute. The fact that there's structured data in here, like 
oh, this is a pair, you know, and th this is interpreted as a pair is not captured here. So um, what I'll do next is, is talk about how to capture that. But before doing that, um, let's shred this data and turn it into a graph, just like we saw before. That, um, you know, I, I said how given tables in a schema, we can create a graph that captures that. And this is what happens uh, when we do that here. So as before, we have nodes for every, you know, thing involved, Alice, Bob, users, strings. Uh, and the arcs are labeled by these uh, the four functions. So uh, that's what I mean by four sorted triples. But um, yep, that's what uh, we call these algebraic property graphs. That's what they look like um, in this representation. So uh, pause here and see if people can work out the connection between this slide and the, the previous one. Okay. So, right, as I mentioned, the, uh, this representation is a bit overly general because it doesn't speak to the fact that, oh, we actually want like these types to be types in the sense of like a programming language. So up here, it's just, you know, we have a set, but really we want these types to be like inductively generated from some type theory, for example. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what we can do. So um, there is a, a type of, so, so far what we've seen are finitely presented categories. Like in this, in this here, uh, we have nodes and edges and then path equations. Uh, but you know, there are categories that have additional types of constructions in them besides uh, what we've just seen. So in particular, there's something called a product category. So this is a category in which you can guarantee the existence of objects that look like they are products. Um, there's something called a co-product category. There's you know, all these constructions in category theory that mimic the behavior of operations from type theory, like products and co-products and whatnot. So there is a, a formalism that still denotes a category, but that denotes what's called a product category that uh, you can write a diagram that looks like this, where you put user times user like in your schema, and this has meaning. So it means in particular, uh, user is a, a set user times user is the Cartesian product of that set and first and second are the projections. So uh, anyway, what, what I'm getting that is we can extend the category theory formalism so that we can mark particular nodes as being products or sums. And when you do that, you know, the story repeats instead of equational constraints like before we have, well, you know, product and sum constraints. And so um, anyway, uh, in, in the categorical literature, these are called product sketches, there's something called a co-product sketch, but um, yeah, the basic idea is to mark certain nodes as products or sums. And when you do that, you get a more uh, efficient representation of these algebraic property graphs. So in particular for each, uh, what we were calling a uh, label before, you get a table that just has uh, the, rel the uh, elements that correspond to it. So the five elements are split among user and trip. And then the rest of this is just generated like inductively, like you don't even necessarily have to like store it on a computer, right? Like user times user is just going to be, you know, since there's three things here, there's going to be nine over here, right? It's uh, so anyway, that's um, one way to make to make these algebraic uh, property graphs even more algebraic is, uh, you know, consider them as, as being product in some uh, categories and use an even more refined notation. Uh, let me pause here. We've been going pretty fast. Um, any questions on this slide? Are you, you say it's just product categories and not Cartesian categories? Uh, for the purposes of this talk, they're the same. So like technically in like the CQL tool, they are Cartesian multi-categories. Here in this talk, we're just using product categories, but the yeah, the difference doesn't really come up. Um, I'd say more the thing to focus on is that we're also going to have like some ones next, and so yeah, it's more like do you want products and or do you want sums as opposed to do you want a category or like a a, a multi category? Uh, did that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Uh, it's also the case that this does mean. 
uh, Cartesian product, not like monoidal product. So in particular, in the set valued models of these sketches, we interpret this as product in a category of sets and not like monoidal product in some other category. Uh, that may well be a thing. I'm sure mathematicians have written tons of papers on that. But uh, yeah, it's intended to indicate Cartesian product given the set valued nature of the models. Um, and so that forces us to have the laws on projections? Correct. Is that what you're saying? OK. Right. And they are, um, yeah, the notation gets tricky. Like you, you know, first and second are, they have meaning here. They're not just random labels, right? Uh, ditto for the, the times. So, but uh, okay. Uh, th these are good questions. Any others? Okay. Uh, Dually, here is just a similar example way where we are saying that. Uh, each trip, rather than being a pair of a user and uh, another user, say the driver and uh, the passenger, here we just work out what happens if we use a plus sign instead. So this means that a trip is now associated with a driver or a passenger. So that doesn't really model reality anymore. I don't know, maybe it was self-driving calls or something. But uh, <laughs> Even then, I'm not sure what this would mean. Anyway, it has meaning in category theory, though. So if this node over here is indicated as a plus, uh, what that means is that each user gets injected into it uh, in two different ways. So user one, user two, user three, here's what we would call the left copy. User one, user two, user three, here's what we'd call the right copy. So this in left and in R are like little tags uh, like you would find in a functional programming language. Um, and then, yeah, so the Basically, from products and sums and this little commutative square, uh, you have a meta model for uh, Uber's Dragon, which is you know like a relatively large encompassment of their of their data set over there. So um, anyway, it's heartening that uh, so a lot of these a lot of this theory, like you know, was originated in the '80s, say or the '90s, right? Like what product and sum sketches are. So it's, it's heartening to see it. Uh, making its way into practice. Anyway, um, I can conclude now with uh, the final thought, which is like, what does all this have to do with RDF? Like, how do you represent these uh, categorical databases or, or algebraic property graphs um, in RDF? So um, as before, we can start with one of our, you know, we can do our product sum representation and then shred it and turn it into a graph like this. So, so when you do that, Right, you find now you know you still have Alice, Bob, and Chaz, but the uh, the arcs are a little different. You have like first and second projections. You're, you're remembering like, oh, this node is in fact uh, the product of these two other ones because there's a first and second edge. So you are doing like a bit of a encoding, but it, it all works out just as you'd expect. Anyway, last slide. Um, what does this mean in practice? Well, you can take one of these. Uh, graphs and shred it into RDF simply by assigning a resource uh, to each identifier in all of the tables. So, um, right, what does that look like? So the two trips, their resource in RDF, this could be either a literal or a URI or a blank node, what have you, we'll call it T1 and T2 uh, for these two things. You know, you mark everything with uh, a particular RDF resource and now you have a faithful encoding uh, right into RDF. You can go from this graph back into these tables and vice versa. And um, although at Uber, they do a more stylized translation to get into RDF that takes into account, um, you know, more products and sums and, you know, more fine structure than what we're doing here. Uh, this is a fully general uh, construction. Um, anyway, that's the, uh, that's the talk. Um, I hope everyone liked it. Are there any questions on this slide or any others? Uh, I was a little confused on the meaning of integration on this slide that mentioned that. Okay. So there's schema integration and then there's the data integration part. Um, <laughs> I think both. Uh, on the schema first. Oh no, actually it wasn't this one. It was one before this. Um, and the one before that. For evaluation. Mm. 
No, sorry. Maybe it was it was the one <laughs> that you showed um, first, the one with the okay. the data integration part. Yeah. Peter yeah. Peter and all that. I got lost here, uh, and, and the previous ah. one, the schema the schema integration. Right. So this, um, happy to walk through it again. Um, it does take a you know it's a heavyweight thing to do. So let me ask: Are there are there questions before I, I launch into the to the spiel once more? Okay, so what this screen is showing is uh, mathematically also a push out if you frame it the right way. Really the thing to note is that our inputs are on the same schemas as before, right? So source one, it had observation, persons, method, and type. So over here we have observation, person, method, and type, right? So observation one, you know, each database is in the same location on the screen as each source. So source two has observation person and gender in the lower left. Here we got observation person and gender in the lower left. And similarly, we have links between the overlap here. So links between them, the overlap, observations in common, persons in common. These are in the upper left. And down here, we have a database containing record links. So people may have heard that phrase, you know, working in data, the record linkages between the records arranged onto a schema that's in common, right? So here we have a link between Peter and Pete, which is to say that, and so I, you know, I haven't really talked about you know, what mappings between databases are, but they're assignments of the, the identifiers in one to the identifiers of another in a way that doesn't lose information. Uh, what this is just saying, since there's no information here in person to lose, it's just a naked identifier. You know, we just map P to Pete and we map P to Peter. So um, if you're programming this up in our tool, you might write a query that says match on strings being the same plus, mi plus or minus one character. Or you might say, go look this data up in a spreadsheet. Some experts already collated the people. Either way, you would put the record links. Uh, mathematically, either way, the record links is, will look like this. It look like a database on the schema that is in common to the two sources. And then finally, given all this information, so the source one, source two, and then what the overlaps are to you, which is a choice, like in this case, we're choosing to link Pete and Peter, you know, you don't have to, maybe the IRS links them, but the CIA doesn't. Given the two sources and the overlap, there's one way to get a result that merges them together. And that result in this case has exactly one new gender, you know, not two, not three, not none. Uh, it has blood pressure and weight in here exactly once. Um, it has Peter in here once, even though both of them had their own notion of Pete and Peter. Uh, it's generated some fresh, uh, I guess you would call them null values. They're not quite SQL nulls because they have, you know, they're more like fresh identifiers, right? They null one down here is the same null one as up here, right? It means there's a, there's a new method here, uh, right? Method came, it, it's in the upper right, but there's no method in the lower left. So we, we're gonna have to create them in order to integrate the data. So there's new methods down here. Uh, so anyway, this is, yeah, this is our particular semantics of data integration. Um, we're not the first to propose it using what's called pushouts to do this. But um, anyway, hopefully this is at least sort of recognizable as what people today do in practice. They like find links between schemas that characterize overlap, and then they find links between data that characterizes the, the overlap at the data level, and then uh, you get an answer. Okay, no, thank you very much. That, that helped quite a bit. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> the other set of slides has a formula for this, which is uh, yeah, a bit, bit tough to walk through also, but uh, cool. Other questions? I joined a little bit late, but it, it, is this, this is all implemented in your tool, the uh, CQL? Correct. Um, this is all implemented. Um, the, this thing here is being productized directly um, as like, a, so we have the, the CQL tool, which is general purpose, and then we're commercializing particular patterns with it, such as this one um, in particular things that, that you can buy and get support for commercially. Um, so uh, 
Yep, it's uh, all available open source. There's some papers on this uh, that you can download as well and uh, proofs are all available and yep, all implemented and uh, comes out of the box in the CQL tool. Awesome, thank you. Other questions? All right, we are at 7.03, which is exactly one hour. So uh, I guess the, the timing is good. We know how long the slides take. Um, that's all the material that was here uh, for today. So uh, I'm happy to remain for a little while if people have other more in-depth questions they wanted to talk about. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. That was uh, what we wanted to cover today. Hi, Ryan. So do we have the recording of the session for reference space? Yes. Uh, it is recording. I just double check. I probably should have double checked earlier. Um, once it's made available, which takes a few hours, I'll post a comment in the meetup with the link and password. And these slides okay, will be there as well. Yeah, thank you. A random question: uh, Do you do you all formalize these developments in any like dependently type language like Agda or Coq for like correctness or something like this? Yes, all of the algorithms for uh, the APG stuff um, is totally formalized in Coq, and you can download them in one of our GitHub repos. Uh, yeah, that's just sort of a best practice when publishing academic papers. Is there kind of a navigation mechanism where you don't know what the name of a connector is like first or last, but you can find it like you're in the middle of an RDF maze and you can find out what's next to you sort of? Yes, we, uh, or rather there's a lot of context available to do that, right? Like IntelliSense should go nuts in a, a, a circumstance like this where literally all you're doing is traversing foreign keys. That being said, the open source tool, uh, it's IntelliSense is pretty minimal uh, because it doesn't, um, like it, it operates at the parser level, like before some of the semantic processing is done. But I mean, you're right, like in, in principle, there is so much that IntelliSense can do, uh, not just things like suggest column names though, uh, you know, because of all the path equations and such running around, you know, IntelliSense can do things like suggest queries, which can mm -hmm. then be like mm. ruled out based on, uh, you know, semantic constraints. So actually we have a product about this. So it, it works not in CQL, our, you know, our own language, but it works straight up in SQL. And so you can like take your SQL schemas that look like this, mark additional constraints in them and then throw code at our tool. And it'll say like, oh no, you missed a join condition or yep. You know, logic says everything's cool. No, you're not going to have any dangling foreign keys. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, I guess, the tip of the spear in getting some of this technology out of uh, CQL and into SQL masses. Um, mm. Anyway. Other questions? Yeah, I just noticed that, that Tinkerpop has a lot of different ways of traversing things and it seemed like it would be able to help <laughs> in this area. Indeed. So to actually implement this on any particular data model, so uh, take you know SQL. To implement mm -hmm. this on SQL, we have to be able to translate CQL into SQL. And mm -hmm. the theoretical or the, the theoretical characterization of what we need is relational algebra, fixed points, and key generation. So and anything that can support that. So SQL can support that. So we've got an SQL backend. Uh, Tinkerpop, my understanding is it can also support those things if only through like, you know, SQL for Tinkerpop, right? In, so um, yes, the, the Tinkerpop version of this, and I see Marco's here and of course, Josh works uh, with Tinkerpop as well. Like it, uh, we will need to implement a code translator from this onto Tinkerpop to support uh, running this on graph databases, which is actually mm -hmm. something we're, we're working on now uh, that we've identified use cases around things like knowledge graph merge that actually like demands this kind of tech. So uh, yep, we are in fact targeting Tinkerpop 
uh, in the same way that we target JDBC for like the relational stuff. <laughs> kind of think of JDBC and Tinkerpop as uh, you know data access layers. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Sure. Are there questions? All right. I guess this is the end of the line. Thanks everyone for coming. This was uh, pretty fun. Uh, and if anyone, uh, yeah, like if uh, you have suggestions for speakers or want to speak or what have you, uh, please reach out. Um, you know, we're always looking for stuff like that. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. All right. Yeah, thanks. See you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks.